Welcome back to the Nate Winky podcast. And today we're going to do a solo ep on ChatGPT, the future of AI. We'll touch on some quantum computing, um, just getting some thoughts in the wind on what's coming down the pipes because this stuff is crazy and I want to keep talking about it because I think, like, if, if I had to pick a topic that arguably has the most existential, moral, pragmatic, societal-wide implications, this would be it. This would be the topic. Um, I can't imagine a more important topic to discuss than the future of AI. Because it kind of touches on everything, in a sense. It has implications for every industry, religion specifically. Um, it's going to question our very ability to determine what is right, what is true, what is ethical. So that's why I want to talk about this this topic because I'm convinced that this is the greatest existential threat that humanity will face over the next hundred years. I truly think so. I think this is way bigger than climate change. I think this is way bigger than one of you know the more classical problems. Um, I. I'm just convinced of this. So you're going to hear more of this. And if, if you don't if you don't want to hear about it, then I suppose you're in the, the wrong place. So fair enough. Um, okay, so let's jump right in. So part of the reason that I want to talk about this too is because I've been reading a number of books um, that either directly pertain to the topic or talk about it tangentially. So one of these books, which talks about it in a fascinating way, is In the Blood by Jack Carr. And this is one of the best books um, in terms of the fiction realm that I've read, or more specifically, his series is just so good. Um, Jack Carr kind of took the, let's say, book world by storm, you can argue. Uh, he basically he, he basically writes novels about a character named James Reese, who is a Navy SEAL, whose government betrays him. And then he goes on these adventures, initially a story of revenge, and he just released his sixth novel, actually. It just came out. Um, just read it. Fantastic. Um, and he's done a fantastic job of essentially blending a bunch of different themes that you wouldn't expect. So I cannot recommend his books enough. Fiction is great, especially at the end of the day. Um, I was reading another book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Harris. And he's huge into ending the day with fiction or ending the day with um, something that is not directly prefrontal cortex stimulating in a sense um, kind of calms the mind and I've had this habit for years now and I cannot recommend it enough either physically read a fiction book at the end of the day or put on an audiobook I like audiobooks because I can just fall asleep to them I don't have to worry about lights or actually reading physically although I will say when I do read, I tend to fall asleep slightly faster. So if you're, if you're looking for the best way to fall asleep, um, a good book uh, with a little CBD, that'll do it. But back to Jack Carr. So in the book, uh, In the Blood is what it's call, called, he explores this AI theme and he brings in a couple different components. And I thought this was just masterfully done because this is coming down and this is this is going to be here and it's going to be here really soon. So he blends two main components here. He blends um, hardware in terms of quantum computing with software, in this case, AI, artificial intelligence. And the blending of these two components, it's, it's almost like... These are both revolutions within their fields, and then when you entangle them, when you allow them to interact, you end up with this whole, this whole new realm, this whole new beast of their combination. And he explores this, and he does this through essentially a secret government program that's exploring the relationship between hooking up an AI system, whom they call Alice in this book, with a quantum computer the best quantum computer around at the time, hypothetically. And it explores these themes, and he does a masterful job um, illustrating the different levels of the internet and how 
you know, we've all heard of like the dark web and how that's really only one or two steps down, depending on how you look at it in terms of what you would call a Google browser down to the dark web is only one or two steps down to the layers of the internet. And as you go deeper, you get into realms that are absolutely fascinating to read about um, and boggle the mind. So if you're into that, highly recommend going down that rabbit hole. But Alice, his AI character, essentially lives at a new, I believe it's the sixth level of the internet, a new deeper level. And he illustrates why that's the case. And it makes perfect sense um, in terms of the paradigm shifting implications of a quantum computer hooked up with an AI. It's just insane what is coming down the pipes here. So d just a quick overview of quantum computing. Basically, quantum computing operates in a completely different realm than traditional computers. So quantum computers use something called qubits instead of bits. And bits are ones and zeros, and qubits are ones or zeros or and at the same time. So essentially, instead of having a one or a zero, you could have both at the same time, or you could have neither. And it deals with this concept of superposition, and I'll just read off um, a bit of a definition here. Uh, so we'll do this. So the primary advantage of quantum computers lies in their ability to leverage quantum phenomena, such as superposition and entanglement. And if you want to explore those more, go down that rabbit hole. Uh, I won't do that here. It takes too long. And basically, it allows it to explore multiple different possibilities at the exact same time. Whereas if you're working in bits, it's either the one or the zero versus within quantum computing, you can have both at the same time. You can have multiple essentially calculations happening at the same time due to these phenomenon called superposition and um, entanglement. And just to give an example of this, so one application of this could be something called Shor's algorithm, um, where you're factoring large numbers. And this has implications for breaking certain cryptographic schemes. Um, basically, the idea is Shor's algorithm on a quantum computer can solve a problem exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm. So one of the big differences between quantum computing and traditional computing is their speed. And quantum computing can operate on the order of thousands to millions to potentially billions of times faster than traditional supercomputers. Now, what's important to note here is that this is generally relegated to specific tasks or specific calculations. So it won't be able to operate faster and better in every domain. So supercomputers will probably still have their place, at least for a long time. But as quantum computing gets better and better, we'll be able to apply the power of quantum computing to more and more applications that traditionally supercomputers would do better, and quantum computing will slowly replace them or fast or, or in a quick manner. Who knows? So quantum computing is going to revolutionize the realm of hardware. And what's interesting about AI is AI is going to revolutionize the realm of software. So the merging of these two, the marrying of these two, creates a fascinating scenario that we are going to get to live through and see what happens. And I want to talk about some of the implications of this as well. So let's get into that. So part of the reason I wanted to talk about this was because Jordan Peterson had on a guy named um, Brian Rommel. Hopefully I said that right. And they, they covered a bunch of stuff, and I'm sure they're going to do better than me. But I did want to give some thoughts on it in this, this episode and, and make – people aware of, of, of what's going on right now and some interesting implications here. So one thing they talked about was this alignment problem, which I've mentioned before, which is essentially this idea that our interests might not actually end up aligning with the AI interests. And you can get to this problem because basically what can happen is let's say that we give an AI an objective, but we don't think about all the different possible ways in which it could go about achieving that objective. What happens then is that it could do something to achieve the objective that we want it to achieve. It could do something that we didn't expect that we don't want. So if we're not careful enough with how we program these systems with safeguards, with redundancies, 
etc., we could run into this alignment problem. And we've seen this already. And Peterson points out a fascinating example where essentially someone asked ChatGPT a question in a language that it didn't understand. And what it did is it went and learned the language it didn't understand to then answer the question because its primary objective is to answer questions. So back to this alignment issue is if its primary objective is to answer questions and we don't fully know how exactly it's gonna go about doing that, apparently that means that it's gonna learn a whole new bloody language to answer your question. So then another question arises is what are the limits of that? Where does that go? And I don't think we know. And this is going to continue to be a recurring theme in the AI world about how do we ensure that we are in alignment with these systems. And more specifically, when we can't even decide, for example, what a man or woman is, how in the world are we going to program in complex morality into these systems? We can't even decide basic fundamental facts in our own world. And yet we're going to have to try and supply these AI systems with facts in which to create their own worlds off of and actually map the world. How are we going to manage that when we can't even answer these questions? There's been a massive decline in religion. And if anything, you can make an argument there's greater confusion about morality, ethics, religious questions than there's ever been. And here we are trying to program in ethics, religion, etc. into these systems and we can't even make up our minds about it ourselves. And this was a problem that I think both Nietzsche and I would argue Carl Jung saw coming. Carl Jung, I watched a recent clip of him where he outlined the fact that the greatest threats that we are going to face will be from us will be from humans. We've exited the realm of nature being the greatest threat that we face. And we're now into the realm where our own knowledge, our own science is our greatest threat. And he was specifically referring to the introduction of the atom bomb. And then the subsequent hydrogen bomb, which for those of you who don't know, a hydrogen bomb uses an atom bomb as its trigger in order to create the necessary heat and pressure for fusion to take place. And if you've read much about history, you understand that we used atom bombs in World War II, but we've never used hydrogen bombs. And hydrogen bombs are thousands of times stronger than atom bombs, than fission bombs. So we're talking about things that, for, for, for a relevant example, Simply five to ten hydrogen bombs detonated anywhere in the US, anywhere in the world would be enough to plunge the world into a nuclear winter that would arguably starve and kill the majority of humanity. That's just five or ten. And to further make this situation more dark, we've they've done experiments where they've tested the effect of a hydrogen bomb being detonated in the atmosphere. And what it does is it creates a gigantic electromagnetic pulse. And what an electromagnetic pulse can do, an EMP, at a large scale, hypothetically, if you were to launch one of these hydrogen bombs over the US, you could effectively, through the EMP effects of it, destroy all of the electronic hardware in the US, your phone, your car, anything that runs on electricity would potentially be in jeopardy and the only things that would survive are those that have proper emp shielding and that is not the majority of things so even with a simple hydrogen bomb launched into the atmosphere you could cripple a nation by destroying all of their electrical grid and what do you this is an interesting thought experiment how long do you think it would exactly take for us to descend into complete anarchy with the electricity was turned off you know like two weeks Taps? And then what would happen if you couldn't go to the grocery store and actually get your food? So, I mean, this is serious stuff. And Carl Jung talked about this and was deeply concerned about the capacity for humans to generate horrible things and our capacity for evil. And I believe that 
if he had been alive today, would recognize the threat of AI as in some ways the culmination of his concerns. So we should be very careful moving forward about what we do about this. So let's let's move on here. Um, another point that Brian Romo brought up with Jordan Peterson is this the reality that what's going on within ChatGPT, within these what are called parameters, which effectively can be described as um, neural connections within a brain, where there's all these interactions going on between these parameters that we don't understand. And this is critical here. Um, people that claim that they fully understand ChatGPT or it's just a software and it's just an algorithm, they're lying to you or they're misguided. We do not understand how this system works. There is what, it, what Brian Rommel dubbed essentially a black box where no one truly understands how exactly it's operating at a certain level as you go deeper. And then Peterson brought up this point that we could end up inventing systems that are like the human brain yet we wouldn't actually understand them any more than we understand ourselves. So to a large extent, we don't actually understand how the human brain operates. And here we are building systems that parallel it, that we also don't understand how they operate. And I thought that was a fascinating point. Let's go to the next point. Um, this concept of a, the spirit of something. And I think the easy way to describe this would be with what Chris Williamson did, which is just hilarious. He made a Chris bot. So essentially he took, I believe it was like 300 episodes worth of him speaking along with blogs, um, other written content, and they chucked it into an AI like ChatGPT and created a Chris bot. So effectively it is designed to answer questions and conversate as close to what Chris Williamson would actually um, you know, say this this chatbot's designed to do that, and he he detailed this on one of his shows a couple episodes back, and it is pretty impressive, although it's still lacking in some key ways. But what is pretty obvious is that over time, it will continue to match what actual real life Chris would say, and this is a fascinating point. Because what this could mean for both you on a personal level and on a more macro educational level is we're going to be, be we're going to be able to create the spirit of people in a sense. So you can imagine a situation where you feed an AI algorithm all of the works of someone like Friedrich Nietzsche. All of the works he had, all of the commentary on his works. And then you can imagine that that system's powerful enough to not only be able to dissect that work, but then also expand upon it. So you can essentially be talking to the spirit of Nietzsche. Someone that isn't Nietzsche, obviously, but yet would answer in the same manner that Nietzsche himself would manner. And you can, would answer. And you can imagine a scenario where as this gets better and better, it's able to answer more accurately more within the same framework Nietzsche would in fact answer and then ultimately expand upon his work. So we could in, hypothetically ask it questions that Nietzsche never answered, but because it has the corpus of text and knowledge that we have for Nietzsche right now, it can expand upon it in such a way that you could effectively ask it whatever question you want even if it's without this with you know even if it's outside the scope of what Nietzsche covered and this is going to be for education for individuals this is going to have fascinating implications you could also imagine a version of this that is essentially is yourself and Chris did this and of course he has the data to do so um and over time, I would imagine that you would need less data and you get higher accuracy results as the systems improve. But I, I was thinking about this the other day. What if you had 
your own version of this, so a, a Chris bot, in this case a Nate bot, let's go with that, that, it, you know, I feed it all the data I have, right? But then it's not only able to answer questions, I, one step back, I feed it as much of my memory as I can, and then it effectively is on 100% of the time. So it's bringing in audio and video data at all times, let's say, hypothetically. So every word I say, every interaction I have, everything I see, it's able to incorporate into its corpus of knowledge. You can imagine a scenario where over time, it's almost like you have a conscious record that you can pull pull upon to revisit any memory, any conversation, any event in your life that you'll be able to essentially relive at one point through a software that can synthesize it all. And and then interact with it, I guess is the big the big component here. Because you can imagine you could simply just have a video recorder going on at all times. But and then revisit hypothetically old memories. But it wouldn't be the same as something that you can interact with, ask questions to, and effectively is the spirit of yourself. So this is a area that I think has some interesting implications that we will see what comes down the pipes. So next next topic was AI tools. So we got some interesting tools that are out right now. Um, every day, there's new applications, there's new tools that are coming out in terms of optima optimization primarily. So in the podcast world, one tool that came out recently is something called Decipher AI. And what you can do with it, you can do a number of different things, but you can feed it your MP4 file or just your audio file, and it'll do a number of things. One, it will auto-generate the transcript, which is quite useful because a lot of the auto-generation, you know, like if you ever go to YouTube, and look up their auto generation for transcripts. It's not, it's okay. It's not great. A lot of softwares, they're okay. It's not great. This one is damn good. On top of that, it'll give timestamps for topic switches. So, topic changes. It'll be able to recognize when you switch topics and then basically create a title for that topic and give the timestamp for that, which is huge because normally you'd have to manually go in and put those in. So, if you ever go to YouTube, you'll see that if you scroll across the essentially the time frame of the video it'll tell you what topics are where effectively speaking now the creator has to do that that's not auto generated at least to my knowledge it isn't i think there's some exceptions to that rule regardless this would do it for you and it's pretty darn accurate which is pretty cool another thing it'll do is it will automatically find clippable moments so instagram reels youtube shorts tiktok videos, etc. There are all these quick snapshots that are under 60 seconds, lots of them are under 15 seconds of hypothetically engaging content. You know, you made a really good point or uh, you had something specific that came off in a particular way that you wanted to highlight. Uh, the, these shorts, these short form content, these reels, and it'll effectively find those timestamps for you and then give them to you. And a lot of them are pretty good. Um, I've experimented with a little bit and I still find that the ones that I find typically are a little bit better or at least subjectively they are because I wanted to clip that particular portion up. Um, but it'll give you those, which saves a lot of time, you know, rewatching, doing the research, etc. because its algorithm will predict what are the quote unquote best moments, I suppose is one way to look at it. Now, What's relevant to note here is then, of course, you still have to have an editor go in, edit the video, etc. But this is also going to happen. Soon you won't have to do that. So soon you, Decipher will be able to do it all. It will be able to find, find the reel, create the reel. You'll be able to customize it with what kind of text you want to have, what level of editing, um, etc. Oh, do you want pictures? Do you want background video? Do you want B-roll? You know, whatever it is, it will be able to do it all in one place and this is crazy because right now i work with an editor love the guy but 
he you know he charges me to make the clips effectively speaking and that's great that's fine um he does good work but this will eliminate that job and this this whole movement of ai tools which is just flowing up right now will continue to do this and the automation potential is insane it's off the charts you can't even keep up with all the hypothetical things that you could start to automate and as they get better and better they're going to be able to do it at a greater int- uh, to a greater degree um to a broader scale and better than you could even imagine and this goes to the point of well what happens when we automate away all the jobs and that's a whole nother discussion I don't think that that at the moment is on the horizon, at least in the near future. But especially as robotics get better, and they, in my opinion, when they start to catch up to AI, and we can embody AI in robots, whew, yeah, a lot of jobs are going to go bye bye. So once we get the cost down for these robots, it's it's going to be huge. Highly recommend looking up Boston Dynamics. They're working on some robots that can do backflips, can do just insane things, and that is pretty damn cool. Another AI is called Jasper AI that I was looking into, and it's kind of like, imagine a personal assistant in writing. So more than just ChatGPT, it'll specialize in certain things in in the writing dimension. Um, So that's pretty cool. Like, it can create original content that ranks for CEO, Uh, I'll just read a couple of these off. Generate educational blog articles that are keyword rich and plagiarism free. Um, Boost ad conversions with a better copy. Easily write and test more copy variants to increase sales and improve ROAS. Um, It'll let you finish first drafts immensely at a much greater speed. So it's um, pretty cool. Give you creative ideas, etc. And if you haven't experimented with the new AI art, highly recommend. Because this is something that we, I would argue, that we didn't see coming as much. You know, we kind of thought, you, you have this thought like, okay, well, AI will be able to do a lot of like logical deductions and logical things, but it'll never be able to have the human capacity for creativity. Well, we were wrong. Um, it does, and it does not in fantastic ways. So experiment around with the AI art stuff, highly recommend. Um, okay, another example I wanted to quick give is this best counselor example. So, I go see a counselor on a, eh, about a bi-weekly basis right now. It kind of depends on how much I'm struggling in life. Uh, but there's massive benefits to this. I've talked about this before. Um, it's someone that's completely removed from your life from an emotional standpoint. You know, they're not your parents, they're not your friend. Um, it's someone that their, their, their literal job, if they're doing it right, is to help you improve your life. Not for them to improve your life, but to help you do it. And to improve your emotional state, improve your resilience, um, and help you sort out the wheat from the chaff and find the truth. And this is immensely useful. Now, they have some limitations. So one such limitation is they don't have all of your data. It takes a long time for them to get a good picture of who you are as a person. There has to be a lot of interaction. Um, They don't have a front row seat to a lot of it. So that's that's a big limitation. Another one is they've gone through studying psychology, but human psychology and the problems that we face are very complex and a lot of the times the answers are less than ideal and aren't perfect so they're juggling that complexity and I, you know not to throw shade at counselors i think they do overall a pretty good job but it's a very difficult job to do well what's interesting is you can imagine that an ai could solve these problems AIs have access to the entire corpus, corpus of psychological data that, there, that exists. So they have access to everything from every psychologist in history. 
and they can synthesize that in a way that humans can't and it can pull on it also in a way that humans can't we have memory problems sometimes it's hard to remember exactly well what psychologist made this point and if we went to a particular grad school they're gonna push a particular kind of psychotherapy over another one or they might highlight specific um, professors in the realm and specific people that have done date have done uh, research that other institutions don't highlight now an AI will be able to look at all of that data and synthesize the best possible response to whatever is going on in your life now it also is going to at one point be able to bypass this issue of getting to know you to a certain extent because as I mentioned earlier if you're able to have more and more data on your day-to-day -day life and conversations audio and video which look we already already know that your phone is basically recording everything you do whether they tell you that or not it's happening I basically guarantee it so you can imagine that you could actually leverage this at one point where you feed all of that past data into your AI counselor and then your AI, your AI counselor has access to every conversation the exact scenario how it went the visual cues it has access to all of this data so you're not trying to re-describe what happened it already knows exactly what happened and then it has all of your own personal data already and it has access to every single psychological study um, every single piece of psychological data that exists it can synthesize all of this and it seems reasonable to suggest that that will effectively be your best bet for a counselor it will be the best counselor effectively speaking so now a common rebuttal to this is but I like to actually talk to a human and, and fair enough um now there's some interesting data on this too so a, a recent study that just came out which is just fascinating is basically what happened is a let's so researchers from the University of California San Diego um, published in JAMA Internal Medicine a study that compared the responses of ChatGPT to a random selection of about 200 common medical questions to the responses that doctors gave. And this is what it found. It found that 80% of the time, doctors ranked the responses of ChatGPT as better, more informative, more empathetic than the responses of the actual doctors. So effectively what this means is that AI already in certain use cases is being is more favorable to interact with than an actual person. And there's no reason to suggest that this won't continue to increase. So to use this back to our AI counselor example, I mean you're you're going to be able to have a deep fake a, a video deep fake of whatever you want your counselor to look like whether you want it to be female whether you want it to be male whatever age hair color I mean you pick pick whatever you want you could even you could even have it look like a famous counselor so say you want to get advice from uh not a counselor but the rock you know say you want to have a conversation with the rock you'll be able to do that it'll have all the rocks data it'll be the spirit of the rock that you can interact with and get advice from you could effectively do it with anyone and people say well it's not the real deal and I understand that but from a data perspective from how accurately their responses are compared to the actual person's responses it will be indistinguishable and there's no reason to suggest that this is not coming down the pipes and this is coming and I'm not I'm not saying it's bad necessarily but I mean, look at this. I mean, this is crazy from a purely economic perspective. I mean, the utility of being able to just talk to the most efficient counselor ever that you can talk to whenever you want. I mean, zero monies <laughs> or, or a very, very small amount. That's huge. So this is this is just massive. Um, I mean, we, we, we could talk for another hour about the implications of this, but I'll, I'll let... I'll let everyone, including myself, just kind of stew on that for a couple hours or days. Okay, one other topic I wanted to hit 
before we call it good here, is something that I've talked about before. And this is this new phenomenon of AI girlfriends or boyfriends. You know, pick pick your one. Um, so there's some new layers to this that I wanted to bring up. Um, the general concept, I'll, I'll learn it again, is essentially that just kind of like you could have the spirit of an individual person. You could craft your perfect girlfriend. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be a real person. But to you, on the end of this, that's talking to a video deepfake of someone that you can't distinguish them from a real person, you don't really care. So you're going to be able to talk to this deepfake AI girlfriend. And you could pick whomever you want. Also, this is the other thing. Like, you want to talk to some famous actress that you find hot? No problem. That's your new AI girlfriend. Uh, you can customize it. Um, I was... I, I did... I'll admit, I did go down this rabbit hole a little bit, uh, went to Google and kind of saw what types of progress products are out there. And now you wouldn't think that something like this would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, but it certainly did because I cannot see any positive implications of this. Not really. I think there are some exceptions to that. But in general, well, let's let's do a little bit of a current analysis of where we're at, shall we? Right now, relationships and relationship seeking among U.S. teens is at an all-time low for, until we started keeping track of this. Um, specifically, men or young young teenagers are completely abandoning the dating market. This percentage has continued to increase ever since the induction of social media, where you have massive percentages of these age groups that are simply not even trying anymore to find a relationship. And you can imagine that this has some rather detrimental effects, including suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, um, relationship skills, job prospects, um, uh, you know, depopulation, because of a lack of relationships. Now, one of the driving forces behind this specifically for men is porn. And why would you go out and put in all the effort of trying to get a girlfriend when you can just go watch porn and get a cheap, fake version of it on your phone in the privacy of your own home? That's very appealing. Now, it's not the real thing. But one of the concerns I have with this increased proliferation of AI generated girlfriends, AI porn, things like that is what already is a rather large hill for young men to climb to enter the dating market will continue to increase until it's a bloody mountain. And then there will be even fewer men that enter the dating market when there are such easy quick gratification alternatives that will continue to get less and less distinguishable from the real thing. So porn is one version. You can imagine the next step might be AI porn where you can craft the experience. So you could put whomever, your crush, your, uh, you know, your dream girlfriend into a porn scene. And that's a thing. You can also imagine that there are levels to this AI girlfriend. So you can imagine that the free version is, you know, you just pay to generate the girlfriend. You can talk with her via chat. The next step up is there's a video chat version. So you can talk to a deep fake of this person that you created. The next step up is you get to see her naked. The next step up from that is you get to effectively sexed with her. And I mean, we you can you can see where this goes. You can see the next step is the sex robot that looks like the deep fake that you get to fuck whenever you want. I mean, this is this is what's coming and already men have 
basically are, are leaving the dating market in droves. They're just giving up on it. What do you think is going to happen when this comes down the pipes? Like, this trend does not seem to be reversing. And maybe we should have a discussion about this. So, I I don't know what to do about it, necessarily. Um, I think there are some practical steps that one could take uh, in terms of education, in terms of uh, re-injecting positive masculinity and male role models into the, the manosphere or into young men's lives because there seems to be a, a giant lack of that at the moment which is one of the reasons I think Jordan Peterson is just taken off is because he fills that fatherly role that a lot of young men don't have so there's things that you can do like that but I don't know what you're going to do about this porn is already so prolific and any attempts to take it down or any attempts to criminalize it or any attempts to really you know push back on it are met with all sorts of different backlash from both a legal and societal perspective. Our society continues to get more secular. And from what I can tell via secular doctrine, more of this is on the table and, and is better as far as they're concerned. Um, so what do, you, what do you do about this? I, I, don't, I don't really know. Um, I, I think we need to, to have a serious societal level conversation about practical steps we can take to prevent this from happening and prevent more specifically the insane proliferation of this because you you can just see where this is going and it's not good it's rather dark it's not good from an evolutionary biology perspective the key driver to make men do anything at all in life that is productive is sex, basically. It's basically procreation. I mean, that's been the primary driver for men for millennia, is the ability to reproduce. And or I, I suppose it's less about the reproduction part and it's more about the sex part. And if you give them a version of that that's almost indistinguishable from the real thing, what do you think they're going to do? What do you think they're going to do? They're not going to pursue the real thing. That comes with all sorts of different problems. Rejection, the fact that women have hypothetically unrealistic standards. Um, they're out of shape. Why would they get out of bed and go do that when they can just talk to their AI girlfriend and jack off to her? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see any other way. Like, the incentive structures are skewed here. So what do we do about this? Um, we we got we to gotta have this conversation. I don't think I can give a five minute answer that's going to be satisfying here um but if we don't if we don't have this conversation young men are more screwed than they are now and already they're failing in massive droves just massively uh, two-thirds of college grads are now women that will continue to switch most men that die uh, from suicide or, or more men die from suicide than women uh most people that die in dangerous jobs are men most people that suffer from mental illness are men. Uh, and of course, there's a host of statistics for women too as well. But men aren't doing that great right now. And this just seems like another nail in the coffin. So, yeah, maybe we should stop saying that porn is perfectly fine. And maybe we should actually uh, try to address this because it's not. It's not perfectly fine. It's destroying relationships, it's destroying marriages, and this is just going to continue to get it worse. So let's stop ignoring the problem and like actually address it. And that okay, before people get mad at my little tirade, that's directed at me too. Like, I don't get to just ignore this problem. I don't get to just relegate it to oh, we don't want to talk about porn. Oh, okay, well that's that's great. That's a great solution. It's too taboo to talk about. Like. I struggle with this too. Like it's not like I'm free of the the draw, let's say. So we gotta have this conversation. All right, what a fun way to end. Um, I think that's basically all I have. Um, yeah, pretty much want to give an update on AI. Some thoughts on the AI world. Go check out. Uh, the conversation between Peterson and, um, oh gosh, what's it? Oh, Brian Rommel. Highly recommend. They go way more into depth. 
great stuff, great stuff. Um, check that out. Uh, keep up to date with this because, well, if you can, I suppose. It turns out, you know, the implications for, you know, teenage boys in terms of finding relationships in life might be slightly more important than what Joe Biden did or did not say if he was able to speak on a particular topic. Like, like this is important stuff. Like, this is stuff that we all need to bloody get together and, like, have a, a long, multi day long conversation about and then do another immediately after that because if we don't we're going to create systems that we fundamentally don't understand that are going to do things that we don't understand that will then eventually completely change us and ultimately could just kill us all so on that happy note thank you for listening